James chapter 1 in your Bibles, the last two verses in chapter 1 are familiar verses to us, and they really flow well from what we had studied this morning. Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 were a reality check or a reorientation for us. Really what Matthew or what G, uh, our Lord is intending to say or, or he's going to get more into uh, his message in verses 26 and following. It's verses 24 and 25, which is kind of a kind of a springboard to everything that he's going to say following that. But it wasn't that we could take any more passages than we took this morning because we, we had a lot of things going on in the, during the service and then after the service this morning. But that reality check says essentially, look, you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you are submissive to him. And number two, you need to be content with being like him and not try to insert your own wisdom and not try to take the Lord's place as some religions have done. You need to be content with where you're at and, and consider yourself sufficient to be like him. So those two principles are in verses 24 and 25. So as we have heard about those, we, we are encouraged not to be, become arrogant, not to think more highly of ourselves than what we ought to think. And we are encouraged in an implied way to go to the scripture because we are submissive to this Lord. He has given us his body of truth and it is sufficient and it is efficient. So we need to go to that truth and study it. And so that we can know what we as husbands or wives or believers in general, what we are to do, how we are to conduct ourselves. This, the word of God is sufficient. So the reorientation or the reality check was, remember, this is your God. You are his disciple. And number two, you need to be content with being his disciple and not strike out on your own and not come up with some novel interpretation of Scripture that nobody has ever heard about, and don't make assertions that you can do things that Scripture says you cannot do and strike out on your own. Very practically, those are some implications of what we heard this morning. And in verses 26 and 27 are a great application of that because there are a lot of people that think themselves to be religious, and yet they do not bridle their tongue. They deceive their own heart. That kind of religion is worthless. And then he gives us a definition that pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. Here is how you ought to show, and here's what your life ought to look like if you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, content to follow him, content to be like him. It's this. Visit the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. See how these two messages in God's good providence, he brought these two messages together, one in the morning and the other one in the evening. Two different books in the Bible. I couldn't have orchestrated that. God did. The late A.W. Tozer proclaimed, we have too much religion, too much religion. He was right. If we know that religion as the work of man to earn the favor of God, he was right in that. We do have too much religion. But Christianity is not essentially religious in that sense. Christianity is not a man-made system to earn the favor of God. It is the God-made declaration that his favor rests upon Christ alone and all who believe in him for acceptance and that for God's acceptance that, and that will be received. That's, that's Christianity. Christ alone, God's sufficient sacrifice alone, nothing else. Another way to put it, religion is man's effort to reach up to God by his own means. And Christianity is God's raising man up to himself by means of faith in his beloved son. So when we say too much religion, we've, talk, we've talked about that as we looked at the Pharisees through the Gospels, John and now Matthew. We've noted that there is too much religion. There are a lot of religion, and there's too much religion. There are too many people playing church that are not according to the words that we have in this body of truth. Believe it or not, 
there was a, a German's chancellor, Angela Merkel, in October of 2010, she said this, we have too little Christianity. Now, that sounds like maybe a, sounds like a sound bite from the Bible Belt. But it was the bold declaration of Angela Merkel, Germany's chancellor, October 2010. She urged her fellow citizens to consider the potential threat of rising number, numbers of Muslim immigrants to Europe. Of course, she is right. Uh, That's pretty much swept Europe. Merkel told the supportive crowd, we don't have too much Islam, we have too little Christianity. Now, I, just, I don't know whether she's a believer or not, but she was making that statement because Christianity counters some of the Muslim beliefs, some of the Muslim customs. And what, we, what we, she's saying is, we have too little Christianity. If you wish to counter something like this, then Christians need to act like Christians and just stop laying down and being a doormat for everybody else to walk on. You need to act like Christians. That's what she was getting at. She was looking for the culture and the belief system to counter, counter beliefs and counter systems um, in her land, in, her, in Germany. Well, we've been studying this since uh, verse 19. Verses 19 through verse 27, the whole section, the long section there is become good hearers and doers of the word. And three important matters to know if we wish to display a living faith. And they're all in verse 19. These three things are, we must be quick to hear, we must be slow to speak, and we must be slow to anger. Very common things that we've heard before. So those are three important matters that we need to know if we're going to display a living faith. And what James does in verses 20 through 27 is he expounds on each one of those sayings. So slow to anger is explained in verses 20 and 21 commented on in verses 20 and 21. If your heart is apathetic to God's word, James says, be quick to hear. If you're prone to spout off arrogantly with how much you know, James says, be slow to speak. If you're fighting some aspect of the word that you do not like, James says, be slow to anger. If you're tolerating the crud of sin, James says, put aside all filthiness if you're resisting God's commands that are designed to rescue you from sin, James says, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. And then in verses 20 through, through 25, 22 through 25, quick to hear is expanded there. The danger of hearing only in verse 22. And then he talks about the deception of hearing only in verses 23 and 24. The deception. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. He's self-deceived. And then verse 25, the duty of hearing and doing. And the last time we were together, the close of the message, we gave an example. Example was something like this. I was hungry and you formed human humanities club Excuse me, I was hungry and you formed a humanities club and discussed my hunger. The point is, is you didn't do anything about it. All you did was talk about it. I was imprisoned and you, and you crept off quietly to your chapel and prayed for my release rather than actually working for and helping me to be released. That's James' point. If you, if you say these things but you don't practice these things, you're self-deceived. And then finally in verses 26 and 27, what we're going to look at tonight is slow to speak. Slow to speak. He's going to expand on that, slow to speak. Genuine obedience. Genuine obedience in verses 26 and 27. We've read this already. Approaching the end of this lesson, these two verses right here uh, function two ways. They function, first of all, they look back. They look back and they recall verse 19. Look at verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to, slow to anger. 
Now read verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and doesn't bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. And then here's what it, and then he defines what real religion is, what it looks like, the practice of real religion. So verses 26 and 27 functions, to, functions as a look back as it recalls verse 19, but it also looks forward and it prepares us for chapters 2 through 4. It's going to prepare us because what James is going to be talking about in chapter 2 is an expansion of verses 26 and 27. He's not done with pure and undefiled religion. He's going to continue to expand and talk about it in chapter 2. We'll see that as we uh, begin to um, examine it next week. Now the words religious in verse 26 and religion in verse 27 are from the same root word. Verse 26 is an adjective and verse 27 is a noun. And the word there refers to outward external religious acts. We're not talking about the motives of the heart necessarily. We're not talking about what's going on in the real man, the, the heart of man. That's not his point here. His point is that if someone who claims to be religious, and we're talking about somebody who claims, as we'll see in just a moment, somebody who claims to go to church and do communion and do all these other kind of things, those, that's the kind of surface level that he's looking at. So it's almost James approaches this from a very different perspective than what we talked about in Sunday school this morning. God draws the heart. God does all of these things on the heart, and then there is the response, man's response. God changes the heart. Here James is looking at, well, a real believer's life looks like this. I'm not talking about the heart issues. That's not James' purpose here. He's not disagreeing with Paul, of course, but his purpose is not looking at the core issues. I'm just looking at you the way you say. You say you are, but just by observation, you're not because of the way you live. That's where James is going. That's what religion and religious um, imply there. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a word that comments on the true heart of a person here. And we'll see that as we go through here. So let's look at this passage uh, line by line and uh, see if we can understand it a little bit better. And then we'll make some comments on it. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, that's conditional, right? You have the if statement there. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and then there's a temporal condition here, while not bridling his own tongue, but deceiving his own heart. Here's affirmation. The religion of this man is useless. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, the, man, the religion of this man is useless. Well, if anyone thinks himself to be religious, a... a temporal condition while not bridling his own tongue but deceiving his own heart here's the affirmation the religion of this man is useless then verse 27 religion pure and undefiled before or in the sight of god uh, excuse me in the sight of our god and father is that's the affirmation here's an affirmation statement here's what re, uh, pure and undefiled religion is before or in the sight of our god and father and then there's two explanational statements. One is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And two, to keep oneself unstained by the world. So you have a condition if, temporal condition, if he thinks himself to be religion while he is not bridling his own tongue, but deceiving his heart, affirmation, this man, the religion of this man is useless. And then the definition. Here is what true religion is, to visit the widows in their affliction and orphans, to keep oneself unstained. So, verse 26, if anyone thinks himself to be religious, that's the, the condition there. Thinks is the word perceive, uh, consider, believe, suppose. It's not consciously, consciously hypocritical. Where these, James is presenting a scenario that the man doesn't 
pretending here or saying that the man doesn't really know. He thinks he's being religious, but he doesn't really know that he is, that he's really not. So we're not, we're not, James is not talking about here a huckster. We're not talking about somebody here who, who is able to play Christianity because they know all the terminology, but in their heart they really know what they're doing. If anyone thinks himself, to, believes, supposes himself to be, considers himself to be not consciously hypocritical, not in their own minds phonies, that's what this means. He doesn't say that they're okay. He just says that if, if you, anyone who believes they are sincere and that they're right in doing this while not bridling their own tongue, that kind of religion is useless. Oh, I didn't know that. I need to change. Yes, you need to change. That's what James is coming across with. That's how he's saying this. So this person has the personal opinion of themselves as not being phonies, not being uh, hypocritical. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, as we noted a while ago, it's outward religious rites, it's outward formalities, rituals, prayer, fasting, the elements of worship, and devotional practice. Those kind of outward things is, is what James is talking about. So if that's the condition, and here's the, the temporal thing, if you think these things, if you consider yourself to be this kind of thing while not bridling your own tongue but deceiving your own heart, hmm. James seems to make quite a bit about the tongue. So we might ask, what's the big deal about words? What's the big deal about the tongue? Well, you know, it's been estimated that the average person will speak about 18,000 words a day. Some of us speak more than others. And that's enough. 18,000 words a day is enough for a 54-page book every day. Every day. In a year, that amounts to 66 800-page volumes that we speak. Up to one-fifth of the average person's life is spent talking. James and Jesus both say that our mouths display our hearts. Our words reveal, for good or bad, what kind of person we are on the inside. And that's the big deal about the tongue. It's such a small member, but it can set the flame such a great fire. So if this person thinks of himself to be that way while not bridling his tongue. He's, in other words, he says, while having a tongue as loose as an unbridled horse. The person who desires to be religious while he does not bridle his tongue is deceiving his own heart. He's living a life of deception. He may not know that, but he's living a life of deception. Outward religion without Clear inward control reveals that the, religion's, the religion is useless. Outward religion without control, manifest clear inward control, reveals that the religion is useless. And that's the affirmation that we spoke about. This man, the religion of this man is useless. What we say does reveal what is in our heart and what we say does matter to people and what we say should reflect the heart that God has given us and you know this look you all have kids or you've been around kids you know that the way people say things with the tone and the words that they use reflects the condition of their heart it does you know that the Bible is right the words come from the very core, the center of who the person is, and it reveals who the person is. But the things they say and how they say it, their tone. This kind of person who thinks himself this way while not bridling his tongue, that religion, the religion of that man, is useless. There are several other passages in Jeremiah that we could look at Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 5, Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 9 comments on 
useless religion in the tongue. And then James goes on to comment on and tell us a, a definition of pure and undefiled religion. So here's the big affirmation, as he affirmed, as we noted when we were just uh, talking through this. Religion pure and undefiled before or in the sight of our God and Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. God here is pictured as a father to the fatherless. Specifically, that's Psalm 68 and verse 5 where it says, our, it says that God is a father to the fatherless. A characteristic of James uh, is that he connects widows and orphans. He connects these two groups, groups of people. And then he explains to us from there, he explains what pure and undefiled religion looks like. It is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. The definition of true religion here begins with the internal concerns in the community of the faithful. In other words, the true definition of religion begins with the local church. It begins with the internal concerns in the community of the faith or the local church. That's where it should begin. To visit orphans and widows may be literally to go and spend time with them such as Matthew 25 and verse 36. But such visiting also is for the purpose of making provision for their needs. As John tells us in his first letter, chapter 3, it doesn't do any good to say be warmed and be filled and then you walk away and don't do anything to help them be warm or be filled. This was no small concern for the mere title, orphan and widow, was synonymous with poverty, both in the ancient world and also in many areas of the world today. You mention widows and orphans, and you immediately think of poverty. You think of people who don't have many provisions in life, whether it be outdoor plumbing, uh, clean water, whatever it might be. Those widows and orphans was synonymous with poverty, have been for hundreds of, and thousands of years. Simply put, true piety helps the helpless. And it begins with believers, helping believers. It begins there, but it doesn't stop there. It goes out to anyone, to everyone who might have a need. And that's, as a footnote here, we need to uh, rewrite our benevolent policy. And I'm in the process of doing that, Fred. Uh, but it is a challenge to, uh, to uh, wordsmith that thing. Um, to hit just the right marks so that we're not, you know, we don't become a bank, a lending bank. We're not a lending bank. Uh, but at the same time, and, and nor, not, not only are we not a lending bank, we're, we're, not a, we're not an institution or an organism, an organization that gives money out to people that are just going to use it to buy things that they shouldn't buy. Now, how do you strike a balance in print on that? That's the challenge. So it is, wordsmithing that is a challenge. And the wordier you get, the longer it's going to be. Try to get it down to one or two or three principles that will capture every kind of situation. Those principles will guide you. Either that or you write something about this thick. But that's where the scriptures lead us. They take us that way. They will not, the scriptures will not allow us to take care of our own and damn the world kind of approach. Scriptures don't let us do that. Scriptures call us to be a light and to, and to show that light in one way is provision for those who are helpless, the widows and the orphans. This is consistent with the law in Exodus 22 and Leviticus 19. The prophets called Israel back to obedience to the law. Helping the helpless was commensurate to wise living. And here are some passages that we, that we need to look at. In Proverbs 19, verse 17, we'll see how, what Solomon says about helping the uh, helpless. In Proverbs 19, verse 17. Proverbs 19, verse 17. One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord. 
and he will repay him for his good deed. It's not a promise that the Lord will repay you back if you give $10 to somebody. It's not a promise that the Lord will give you $20 back. Uh, scriptures don't make any, of the, any kind of promises like that. If it does, it's only to the nation Israel. But you get the idea here that God, one who is gracious to the poor, is as if they were lending to the Lord. And God, of course, will not forget that act of kindness and will repay in whatever form and whatever timing that God may decide to repay. Uh, Proverbs 21, verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is desired by the Lord more than sacrifice. And that's not just restricted to believers only, but to do righteousness and justice to everyone and to anyone that the Lord may put into our, into our path. That's more desired, is desired by the Lord more than sacrifice. On chapter 31 and verse 9, there's another one. Chapter 31 and verse 9. This is the words of King Lemuel. He says in verse 9, Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. So scripture, not only Proverbs, but there are other passages as well um, all throughout the Old Testament. The New Testament shows the same kind of care and attention. Acts chapter 6, the Hellenistic widows were being neglected at the tables, and so they needed to respond to do that. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 3 and following talks about how to care for widows. Who's on the widow's list, who's not on the widow's list, what age, it even says an age. So there is information there. Uh, God is indeed concerned in the New Testament church and Israel were concerned for the proper treatment of those people who could not defend themselves. Now, of course, uh, some people... Um, Liberals, whether they be religious liberals or political liberals, progressives, they latch on to these kinds of things and they make this a platform for all kinds of welfare. And they make this a platform for all kinds of doling out money and redistribution of wealth. And that's not where scripture goes because scripture says if you don't eat, or excuse me, if you don't work, you do not eat. So if we really want to be biblical about it, then let's turn to the passage in Timothy, or Thessalonians, where it says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Where is that? How, why is it that we've forgotten that passage, but we elevate all the others that talk about helping the poor and the needy, and those are good. So these passages can be taken grossly out of context, and the spin can be put on those that Scripture never intended uh, to have, to have uh, interpreted that way. So there is a rebuke here in our text in James. There is a rebuke here for those who attend to the outward cultic or the outward religious shows of their religion while they sadly neglect the inner compassion that is shown outwardly in care for others. Are we all deceived so that we are not sacrificing for orphans and widows? James does not define generally what religion is but reminds us that religion without the things that, he's mentioned, that he mentions here is nothing. It's not, it's not religion defined in all of its nuances, but a statement of what is better than the outward acts of worship is what he's saying here. So it's very important that we do these things. Very important. In the last statement, the explanation statement, explanatory statement about what true and undefiled religion is, is to keep oneself unstained by the world. The, um, the continuation here of what true religion is has to do with moral attitudes and behavior, not external religious rituals. So James does comment on the actions, what practically what the actions ought to be, which you, what a true a uh, believer ought to look like, but there's also an inward aspect as well to keep oneself unstained by the world. So it's both. It's not either or, it's both. And that's his point here in this last 
uh, piece of explanation that he gives here. The world is a moral word, and it represents the antithesis of God. So we're not talking about keep one's stay, uh, self unstained by the world, and you think, does that mean I can never play in the dirt? No. The word world is moral here, and it's the opposite. It's the antithesis of God. So to keep one staying, oneself unstained by the world system, keep from getting bruised, permanently scarred by the, the world system. Satan is the god of this world. It's, it's his system that's operating here, of course, under God's providential and sovereign control. The wisdom of the world is to be rejected because rejection will keep a truly wise person from being spoiled by the world's values. This, this idea of the world being used morally, look at chapter 2, verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? It's not necessarily meaning that did God choose the people of this world who didn't have much money or people like Matthew, the tax collectors that were regarded, that were stained by the world, that Matthew operated on the basis of greed because he cheated people and he took more taxes than, he, than they, was, uh, they were required to give. That kind of, in that sense, the word in chapter 2, verse 5, the world is used in a moral way as well. Chapter 3, verse 6, he does the same thing. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. In a moral sense there. So the wisdom of this world is to be rejected. We reject it because it will keep a truly wise person from being spoiled by the world system, by its values. So what is a doer? We can kind of go back and, and look at this sort of a, as, as a review. What is a doer of the world? Or excuse me, what is a doer of the word? What is the reality of our religion? First of all, it is to check your speech. The speech will reveal the heart. The man who does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. So a lack of self-control may reveal a lack of saving faith. Self-deception misleads the heart and results in a worthless religion. James tells us that the lack of self-control can be seen and heard very clearly in the example of a loose tongue. So ex examining this, what is a doer of the word, James would tell us, is one who checks his speech. One who does not check his speech may not be a true believer. The lack of self-control may be an example um, of, of a person being a true believer. Number two, show a love for people in need. What is a doer of the word? One who shows a love for people in need. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is to visit the orphans and the widows in their stress. The poor are exemplified by those most rendered destitute by their loss, the widows and the orphans. And to visit them is more than a as we've noted already, it's more than a casual house call. It means an active involvement in the person's life. Even as God visits his people in salvation, it was more than just spoken word. The word became real. It became a living person, the person of Jesus Christ. God did something for us. One test of pure religion, therefore, is the degree to which we extend aid to helpless in our world whether they be widows and orphans, or immigrants, immigrants trying to adjust a new life, impoverished third world people who are living in those kind of conditions, handicapped, homeless, whomever it might be. That is how we handle that is a test of true religion, pure and undefiled religion. 
Will we ever be able to eliminate everything? Jesus says, in the world, in this world, you have the poor. They are always with you. They will always be with us. It's really a foolish dream to imagine that you could create some sort of system that would eliminate all the poor. The poor will be eliminated. It's called the millennium, when Christ reigns from Jerusalem. But until then, Jesus' statement is still true. The poor you always have with you. There will always be the poor. What is a doer of the word? It's one who checks his speech, one who shows a love for people in need. And third, one who lives without compromise. One who lives without compromise to keep oneself unstained by the world. James will warn us about being friends with this evil world system. He'll do that in chapter 4 and verse 4. He will tell us, you adulterous, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of this world makes himself an enemy of God. Well, we have to examine that. Because there's a question, am I a friend of the world if I do this? If I'm a friend, am I a friend of the world if I do that? How do I know when I've crossed the line, when I become a friend of the world? Moral stains from the world system are far more serious than ritual stains from sacrificing animals. And so that's what James calls us to. What is a doer of the word? It's the doer of the word is one who checks his speech. He exercises self-control in his tongue. He shows a love for people in need. It's the heart of a person. We think, we think of this is a good person who does that for somebody who's in need. It's what Christ would do. Does that mean they're all believers who do that? No, of course not. But a true believer does do that. And that believer, that person who is a doer of the word, lives without compromise. The word of God has been spoken to us. The word of God speaks to us. There's a gray-haired lady a while back ago. She was a, a member of her church for a long time, and she shook hands with the pastor after the message one, sir, one uh, Sunday morning. And she said, that was a wonderful sermon, just wonderful. Everything you, saw, uh, everything you said applies to someone I know. She didn't get it. In relation to self, check your tongue. In relation to others, you ask yourself, do I have a desire to help others? In relation to the world, Win or be like the world. Either win it, share the gospel with it, or be like it. But we can't walk the fence in relation to these things. Regarding helping others, there are lots of opportunities to help others. There's nursing homes around here, and people love to have visitors at nursing homes. Well, it's inconvenient. Yeah, I know. Thinking of others as more important to yourself is always inconvenient because we are born sinners. So it always will be. There will never be a time in your life where helping others will be convenient for you. Spurgeon said, if your religion doesn't make you holy, it will damn you. It is simply pageantry to go to hell in. Well said. We, if it's just religion, we end up going to hell dressed really well. But we still go to hell. Any questions about this passage or what we've said tonight? He is witnesses by meaning the readers that he's writing to. Yes, he's teaching them. He's calling them to conduct themselves well, please, in a way that's pleasing to God. Well, 
Well, you, you, yes, you, you do a lot of things. If you, if your tongue is not controlled, as we've seen here, it's not a sign of true of true religion. It, what it, what you say may damage the testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, it impugns God's character, depending on what you said. And God is capable of overcoming all of these things and bringing glory to himself in spite of us. But our desire and James' desire is that we control our tongue and that we exercise wisdom in all that we say and all that we do. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay, I hope, I hope this was um, um, somewhat helpful. Um, James is extremely practical, and how we speak and what we do really matters. Paul goes from the other, Paul approaches it from the perspective of the righteousness of God in us, making us righteous, righteous making us saved. We are saved because of what God has done for us. James comes across with, if these things you say you are, this is what your life really ought to look like. Now, living like this, James would say, living like this doesn't make you saved. You can't get God's attention by giving away your money and helping people in the food line and um, visiting people in the, in the nursing homes. All of those things are good. But they come, if, it's, if it comes from a person who is unredeemed, who has not trusted Christ as their Savior, it comes from a person whose motives are still impure, whose motives are for my own glory or for the glory of the person that I'm doing it for or to be well thought of by others, but it's not solely for the, for the glory of God. And so in, in Old Testament words, it would be like us bringing a sacrifice to God, but the sacrifice is unqualified because it doesn't meet the standards. Well, how do we bring a sacrifice to God that does meet his standards? First thing we must do is realize we can't. There is no way. We must confess our sins, confess our inability to please God, confess our lack of ability to save ourselves, and cry out to mercy for God. God, apart from you, there is no hope for me spending eternity with you. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. I trust his sacrifice for me. That's it. If you add, I trust his sacrifice for me and, and help me to complete this transaction, I know I must do something in order to be saved. Then you've gone, no, stop. Don't go that far. You have to stop. It's by, it's by, by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. You mean I don't have to do any works? No. Then why are you doing works? I'm doing works as a response to God's grace in my life, not in order to get his attention. The difference between those two is eternity. One goes to hell, the other one goes to heaven. We do works because it is our thankful and appropriate response to people who have been given grace who didn't deserve it. On the other hand, if you do the works in order to get God's attention, that's called salvation by works. And the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, rejects that idea. You can't get there by works. It's not you, it's plus Christ. It's Christ alone. And Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy, Jesus Christ says, I am the mediator between God and man. No pope. No priest, no Mary, no Jimmy, no anybody. He is the mediator between God and man. Only him. No, no mortal man died for your sins. Only Christ did. Christ did. So the world has, you know this, the world has reversed those and confused those since almost the fall in Genesis chapter 3. And people have approached salvation as if it depends upon their efforts to a certain degree and and the bible flatly rejects that the whole purpose of the law in the old testament is to make people realize you cannot live up to the law wow 
There's law. It's just tough. That's the point. You can't live up to it. That's what the law and purpose is to do, is to make you realize you can't save yourself. So that's why we say trust in Christ alone. His work on the cross is sufficient. Trust in him alone. He will change your heart. He will grant you the peace. He will grant you the joy. He will grant you understanding of his word and strength to obey it. But if you're running on your own strength, you will get tired too often. And you will be on your deathbed wondering if you had done enough in order to be pleasing to God. And the Bible gives us much, much better assurance. I write these things to you in order that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 21. You want to know if you have eternal life? You want to be confident, be assured of it? I can show you. You can go to God's word and I can show you. Well, I don't believe it. I just think that God did things, but we have to, don't we have to do something? No, you don't have to. When God saves you, you want to. The love of God compels you. But to try to bust through those proverbial doors on your own strength, they will never fly open. You can never bust through those doors. But when you get on your knees in front of those doors and you say, God, save me. I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. Then those doors will swing wide open. And you can walk right through them. So we have to be careful that we do not um, insert our own ideas of wisdom or depend on our own efforts to get us acceptable to God in any way. It's his grace and grace alone. Father, thank you for your kindness to us tonight. Your kindnesses flow in our life continually. We thank you, God, for this word tonight. We ask that you would help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. We ask, God, that you would strengthen us to change our lives, alter our habits if we need to, so that our lives might align more clearly with your purposes for us. We ask your blessings on Talitha, Bud and Jean, Jean Griffith, Miss Dorothy Savetich. We ask that you would bless her as well, and strengthen her. Thank you, Father, for your, con your constant presence with us and for the promises that we have in Scripture that this work you've begun in us, you will complete it until the end. Grant us to have a faithful week for your glory. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.